So if you have ever read through the whole Bible, um, you will know that there are some crazy stories in there. There are some things that you are reading along and you think, I never noticed this before. What is this? And some of them are just quite odd, actually, especially in the Older Testament. They're in Genesis and in um, some of the history books. There are just very strange things that happen. Um, and some of them are not necessarily strange, but we just don't cover it all. We have a three-year cycle, and we always read something from the Hebrew Scriptures every Sunday, but that's only 156 Sundays, right? So we miss a lot of things. And the story that we heard today is one of those that we probably might miss. It's not um, probably one that is covered in your average Sunday school curriculum, right? You learn about... Daniel and the lion's den, and David and Goliath, and there's all these wonderful stories, King David. But this one, I don't think we encountered this one. I did not encounter this one. Um, and the only reason that it comes up in our Sunday lectionary is because when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, as he is in today's gospel, and he's telling Nicodemus, who comes to him at night, remember Nicodemus the Pharisee, who comes the original Nick at night, and he comes and, and asks Jesus about, he says, I believe you are a, um, a leader, a real true teacher, because nobody could do the things you do unless God was with you. Um, so when Jesus is telling Nicodemus that, he says just, at, or he's talking to him, he says, just as the Son of Man must be lifted up, just like Moses lifted up the snake, and it's like, what? Moses lifted up a snake? Yes, we just heard that story. That's the story I'm talking about. It's kind of a good job as the people, by the way. Um, I got you kind of into a trap. Some of you wanted to read God, too, there. But um, yes, I heard that. Um, so the people are complaining, right? They've been in the wilderness. They've been set free from slavery in Egypt. And they are traveling, and they are complainers. And they, um, they don't like, or there's no food, there's no drink, and there's no food. And the food is really bad. We hate it. It's like, okay, I thought you said there was no food. Um, that's, a, that's one of the great lines of the Bible. Um, and so uh, this is a kind of a thing that has been happening as they're in the wilderness. They complain periodically, and... Um, God gives them manna to eat, and then they're thirsty, and God uh, tells Elijah to strike the rock, and they have their water. They complain repeatedly, and this I think this is the fifth one. They're known as the murmurings. This is the fifth murmuring. And this is the one time that they are not only complaining about Moses and Aaron, they're actually complaining about God. You notice they, they say that they have a complaint against God. And God, it's, it's almost like God is saying, well, I'll give you something to complain about, right? And he, and he sends, and these snakes come, these poisonous snakes, and, the, and people die. So the people say, um, we have sinned, this is bad, we're so sorry, can you please ask God to take the snakes away? So does God take the snakes away? No. God doesn't. God instead makes a remedy for the snakes. He tells Moses to create a snake. Moses creates the poisonous snake out of bronze, and he puts it high on a pole. And then when the people look at it, then even though they're, when they're bit by a snake, they look at the pole, and then they don't die. They can survive. So maybe it's the first um, immunization or something. I don't know. You get a little taste of the snake there, and then... Um, and it, and it works. So there are a couple things about this story that interest me. Um, one is the idea that rather than just take the snakes away, God does it this way. And I don't know why, but maybe if God just took the snakes away, they would forget again. <laughs> they would say, okay, we're clear. We can do whatever we want. Maybe the, it's a reminder that they still need to obey and be careful. Maybe... It's to give them some agency so that they are the ones that they have the cure, but they have to take it. They have to look up, they have to see the snake, and they have to um, 
you know, behold it, and then they will be cured. So um, I'm going to come back to this reading, but let me go to the gospel for a minute. So this is, of course, um, contains one of the iconic verses in the Bible for Christians, right? This is, for some people, this is the summa summation of what it means to be a Christian, right? And I bet there's more than one of us who memorized these, this verse when you were young. I know I did when I was young because when I recite it, it's always more old-fashioned language. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. So that's John 3.16 and 17. John 3.16 is, you know, you, you used to see people at ball games with a big sign that just said John 3.16, like that was supposed to, I don't know, do you think people went home and looked, opened their Bibles and found out what that said? I don't know. Um, so Jesus, before, in making this point, he says, just as Moses did that with the snake, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I think that's interesting because when I think of being lifted up, I think of it as a really positive thing, right? You lift me up so I can do what I need to do. Um, he was lifted up. I, I feel lifted up. It's all positive. In this case, when Jesus is lifted up on the cross, that is not a place he might want to be, right? That is not, it's a necessary thing. But it is not what he, it's not the same. It's more like lifting up the snake on the pole. Um, at Bible study, Dan mentioned this idea that maybe when Jesus comes back and sees all of us wearing our crosses around our necks and the, all of the crosses everywhere, he might say, do you have to pick the worst day of my life to remember? I mean, yeah, that is. That is a question. <laughs> so when I go back and I think about this first reading, there are just a couple things that I um, wanted to draw out, a couple more things I want to draw out. And one is the idea about complaining. Um, because I find it easy to complain. I find it easy to notice the things that are wrong and the things, the little things that aren't going right or the way somebody behaved that wasn't to my satisfaction or the, I had to wait too long in line or the person wasn't attentive or didn't know, you know, there's all kinds of things that we can complain about. And um, I know I've told this before, but I, to me it's just the greatest moment. I had gotten a new refrigerator and um, Everything went wrong with the delivery, right? They were supposed to come one day, they never showed up. I called, they said, well, we'll come the next day, and then they came later, and I had to wait, and then the door opened up the wrong way, and they didn't have the tool. It was like one thing after another. So I was talking to a friend, and I was going through this litany of all of the complaints I had about the whole process. It was so annoying. And when I finished, she said, you got a new refrigerator. And I said, yes, yes I did. <laughs> and isn't that wonderful? And how many people in the world might need a new refrigerator and they couldn't get one? And how many people don't have food to put in their refrigerator? And how many, you know, what a blessing. Yes, I got a new refrigerator. And I think about that often. And it helps me, it, call, it, it catches me when I'm caught in that complaint. You know, yes, it's hard being in the desert and wandering. And we have hard things that we have to do. But the children of Israel were free. They weren't in bondage. They're worth, they were with their families. They didn't have to fear their kids were being taken from them. They were, there were positives, there were good things. So that's the first thing, just that idea that maybe, maybe God doesn't want us to complain all the time. And the other is that it's interesting that what they are asked to do to be cured from that snake bite is to confront their worst fear, really, right? I mean, maybe snakes aren't all of your worst fear. Maybe for some of us they are. But they had just been bitten by one, so that's pretty scary. 
And what they need to look at is that image of a snake. And that maybe what we um, are called to do is to, is to face those fears, is to, um, to be ready to look at them, look them in the face, and trust that God has our back in that. Um, maybe there are times where that's not the thing we need to do. <laughs> Sometimes we need to run as far as we can the other way. But maybe there are times when that is what we are called to do. And maybe that's even what Jesus was thinking about when he's telling Nicodemus what's going to happen in a way that Nicodemus has no idea what he means. But Jesus knows. Jesus understands the Son of Man must be lifted up, and maybe not in a good way, maybe in what is his worst fear. Maybe in when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane and saying, maybe this cup could pass from me. We know that was not something that he desired, right? It was something he was confronting. So um, I guess that's my, my message this Lent. And may we uh, be blessed to see the blessings in our lives. May we be brave enough to confront our fears. And may we trust that God is with us always. Amen. Amen.